welcome to The Crafty View. I'm your host for the show, Diane Williams. I'm a member of the Craftsman's Guild and I'm going to be interviewing another member of the Craftsman's Guild. Her name is Debbie Delashmit. I hope I said that correctly. Mm -hmm. And she works with glass. No, I don't mean she breaks glass. I mean, she really does some incredible things with glass. And so welcome to the show, Debbie. Hi, it's great to be here. Well, tell us a little bit about how you became a person that works with glass and what do you call yourself? I just call myself a glass artist at this point. Uh, became a glass artist out of necessity. I moved into this house 31 years ago and because we're on a hill and there's no one behind us, we have back up to a graveyard. I had no curtains in the windows because I didn't need them and I love the light to shine in. And when we put a deck on the back of the house, we needed to cover those back windows up, but I still love the light to shine in. And for me, the light coming through a piece of colored glass is beautiful all by itself, even the changing light during the day changes the look of the glass all day long. And I started hunting for somebody to build me stained glass windows for the two bathrooms. And even though I looked at all different glass artists and a lot of them in the Craftsman's Guild did beautiful work, I realized that my view was so different that if I wanted to do it, I needed to do it myself. And so I took a course that lasted six weeks and started making stained glass windows for all the windows in my home. For all the Eventually windows. Eventually I ran out of windows. <laughs> that is awesome. You know, I've seen like little squares hanging in people's windows. Mm -hmm. You know, if they lived in an apartment complex, certainly they can't exchange the actual window, but right. it's nice to have those pieces that can hang in a window. So it's so diverse, isn't it? It is. And the first one I did was my young son's bathroom window. And on the lower part, since he loved the ocean, I did an underwater scene and it was created out of textured glass. So all the light comes in and all the colors, but you still can't make out what's outside the window. So somebody could be outside looking in and all you see is from both sides, an underwater scene. It was a lot of fun. It was about the first piece I ever made. Oh my, so I know what inspired you in that regard. That was your son and what he really liked. But what inspires you to come up with different designs and what is your focus on some of the types of designs? If I went to your booth, what could I expect to see? Um, I have been told that my booth is mostly blue and green. And so it's the outdoors and it's nature. And I've heard Bessie say the same thing. I love being outside. I, I, my motto has always been outside's better than inside. I almost have to trick myself into using other colors because I want the sky blue and the green grass in everything I do. I, fish and crabs. I always have a lot of fish and crabs at my booth and they sell really well, surprisingly. So you're a first generation crafter in this regard? Yes, my mother was an artist. I was actually born in Paris. Uh, my family was military and my mother was a wonderful painter and she had five daughters and encouraged all of us to do some type of art. And I'm really the only one that did it in this medium. I think my other sisters are gifted other ways, but I was the only one and I've done many, many different mediums with wood carving, leather tooling, uh, oil painting, watercolors. For some reason, glass was what really stuck with me. And I've been doing it for 25 years now. And I've been in the Craftsman's Guild since 06. So you're a fellow member in the Craftsman's Guild. Yes, ma'am. I wandered into Chimneyville more than 20 years ago because I was at a horse show downtown. And I thought, what is this? And paid my little $6 to walk in. And I was absolutely floored by the talent there, immediately called my husband and said, you gotta see this. And we've been going to Chimneyville for years before I ever had the nerve to apply to be a member of the Craftsman's Guild. 
You know, if you're like me, I love to go on Pinterest and I see some of the most incredible things. I'm not trying to copy any of that per mm -hmm. se, but it kind of inspires you. Um, do you have any role models? Are you seeing, even if you don't name them, are you seeing any types of glass works that you're enamored with right now? One of my first role models was Walter Anderson. Because in stained glass, everything has to end at a point. And all Walter Anderson's block prints end at a point. He has very few pieces where something ends in the middle of the air. It always connects to something else. And so this is one of my first glass pieces I did. This is Walter Anderson's blue crab. You can see all the black lines. That's the solder that keeps the glass connected. And I've done many, many renditions of his beautiful work. And I actually met his niece and I asked her if it was okay. And she said it was, but I, the good thing about glass is you can have 10 people and all 10 people will do it completely different and you can go and they're all great, but it's completely different. And we have so many glass artists in the guild and I don't think anybody does anything similar to the other person. Everybody's gone in their own direction, which is wonderful. I agree with you. I own a couple of pieces from members of the uh, Craftsman's Guild, everybody from Jerry Hymel to Robinson. Mm -hmm. and, and they're totally, totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. That's, and that's, I love to gift their pieces too. I don't just gift what I make. I, I don't know how many Elizabeth's birds I've given away. I probably kept her in business for years. That's something people should really think about. Sometimes, you know, when we're doing our show at Chimneyville or another exhibition, people come over and they say, oh, I don't have a place to put that. But I think mm -hmm. you're right. I started collecting art for my sisters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it, I have, I actually have craftsmen's work all over our house. Um, that, and we still collect every time we go, uh, even to, to the little showcase we just had in December, we still ended up buying, I don't know how many wooden bowls. So I love to share their work because everybody's work is so unique. It's, it's very special to me. Yeah, there's something to be said, you know, you can get something that's been manufactured and now everybody's talking about that country way over there. I'm not going to mention it. And they're saying, mm -hmm. well, is it made in America or where is it made? But see, a lot of times you're buying things that have been made on a machine. But Absolutely. when you look at something that's been made by hand. So mm -hmm. talk to me about what it takes to create that piece you showed us. What is your process? Well, what's interesting about glass, and this is what I explained to people at Chimneyville, glass comes in sheets, okay? It's, this is how you get it. I do not paint this glass. It comes in different colors and it can be transparent like this. It can have a pattern to it like this. And you use that in your design force myself by a red piece or it can also come with texture so this is what I meant about putting it in front of your window you can still see the light through it but you can't really see what's going on through it and you cut each piece and grind it to put in your pattern in a piece like the crab because he's stained glass all his pieces have to fit together like a puzzle. They all have to be ground and laid out and fit next to each other pretty tightly. So that when you solder it, you don't have any gaps. In fusing, it's a little different. Glass is pretty much the same, but you have to get a certain kind of glass for fusing. It's very similar. But in fusing, you lay it out on a kiln shelf and because you put it in intense heat, it melts, it flows like liquid and all the sharp edges round out and you can layer different pieces of glass on top of each other, which is a lot of fun. You can also get iridized pieces, as you see on the ends of his little legs here that, that are shiny and just keep adding. The other fun thing about Fused glass, which is different than stained glass, is almost always flat. But when you fuse something, 
Okay. Confuse it flat, like so. But then you can buy a mold like this. You put your flat piece in it and you end up with a bowl. That is fabulous. Isn't that fun? Fabulous. What's even more fun is you don't have to buy your mold. You can make a mold or anything stainless steel can be a mold. So I got an old pot. I fused this flat and I ended up with a bowl. And it's all a matter of heating it in the kiln. You heat it to a certain temperature, it holds at that temperature and it cools at a certain rate. And you end up with, it's a lot of fun. Does it take a long time to do something like you just showed us? It depends on the process because there's four processes. And that's why it's a little harder to teach fuse glass because you cut it and lay it out and then it's got to go in the kiln and 13 hours later, it has to come out. Or it might even take longer if it has to cool. So it, it's a little more of a process, but you start out making small things. I bought a very small kiln to start with. And then you get larger and larger. And of course, larger things are a little more difficult because you have to take in consideration how slowly something slumps under that mold. If it goes too fast, it's gonna break. If it goes too slow, it won't go all the way around it. So for me, it was trial and error since I was self-taught in the fusing. And I'm still, I'm still not as good as the fuse glass artists we have in the guild right now, but I'm learning and I've got some new things I'm working on during our downtime right now, but there's always something else to learn. Have you ever been able to salvage or refashion a mistake? Yes, um, those are called happy mistakes. And one of my brother-in-law's favorite pieces is a bowl I made and it just folded up. And I thought, and so I fused it flat again and then I slumped it again and it turned out really interesting. And that was his favorite piece. I gave it to him for Christmas. And I said, don't ask me to make another one cause I'll never be able to do that again. <laughs> but that was a fun piece. But yeah, there are certain things you can save and, and certain things you just have to break all the glass up and make something else out of it. But I think the key is that, you know, with that piece that you, you had to refashion, oh, I wanna ask were your, your colors, your blues and greens included in it? Uh, actually it was blue and green bowl <laughs> and he still has it on his shelf. So yeah, it was blue and green. I'm, I'm forcing myself to use some red and orange now. So I have many red and orange friends that would like something that's not blue or green. Well, we know that blue and green are, you know, pretty much your signature. You know, mm -hmm. we can come to the Guild and look a lot of different artists' work and we might question a piece that's blue and green that it just might be Debbie's, but is there anything else that you would say is part of your signature style? Um, I do, I like to make animals. So I do my little cats and I almost stopped posting my cats on Facebook before Chimneyville because I do these little cat faces. And every time I do, I get all these, my phone starts ringing. I want those cat faces. And I'm thinking, okay, I can only make a certain amount of cats and then I gotta stop. And I love to make Christmas ornaments. I love Christmas. And my favorite thing is just to have a whole tree full of ornaments. I've got one little one here that was left over last year but it's just so much fun to make them for people. And I have people come and they say, every year I get an ornament. So every year I try and make a different kind of ornament. So they'll have something different to choose. So I have a little bit of a following that come. Do you ever include mixed media into your glass? Maybe some fibers, some beads? Actually I do. When I was doing stained glass, of course everything's flat. And flat was fun for a while and then flat started getting a little boring. So I started including wire, mirrors, a uh, lot of beads. And I was tried to be a jeweler once, I was a very bad jeweler. And so I had all these beads left over. So I started putting them all in my stained glass. And when I made Christmas ornaments for those, I called it embellished stained glass 
I have here one of my bigger pieces, one of my few big pieces I have left, which is this guitar. Ugh, I'm just gonna take it off on the stand. And it has mirrors, wire, beads. And this is stained glass. This took a long time. And mirrored wire all through the front and a bunch of different kinds of glass just to try and make it really different. You said something interesting. You said it took a long time. I'm not into asking how much anything <laughs> costs, but I think it's important for the listeners to understand that when an artist creates a design, that sometimes there's a lot involved in the accuracy mm -hmm. and, and getting that piece just right, having that mixture, the decisions that go into auditioning it to be what it's going to be. And so the value of it shouldn't be diminished by any means. I, I think that's one of the hardest parts about selling craft is pricing it. And it my husband is in, gets infuriated with me because he said, you're not charging for your labor. And so I started writing down how many hours something took me. And, and sometimes though you come in and you work for an hour and 45 minutes and then you got to go make dinner. So it was really hard. The few commissioned pieces I've done, I kept an hourly rate and I've Googled many times, how do you charge for your work? And it's it's still one of the most difficult things. But for example, the, the guitar, it took about a month. Um, Cause I remember I got home from a vacation and I'd been gone a lot during the summer. And I told my husband, just stay out for a while. <laughs> Let me make something. And he would pick his head in the studio and I'd be like, no, not yet. And it took the entire month of August before I was satisfied with the way it was done. And because it's a free form piece and not surrounded by a square of a frame, I had to figure out how to make it to where it would support itself, which was, I'd never done that before. So that was a little tricky. Um, but, you know, we, and I actually gave him that piece for our anniversary because he was like, don't sell it. So I brought it to Chimneyville a couple of times and it, never, it didn't sell, so I was like, all right, here, it's yours. But I have sold some other guitars and banjos, life-size guitars and banjos. Have you ever thought about the trends that you're setting in the creation? You said you took something to Chimneyville and it didn't sell that year. Have you ever just sat down and said, well, okay, I need to relook at, and I don't want to put mm -hmm. all the words in your mouth, but talk to me about that. That's one of really important things. I've done 16 Chimneyvilles. And I started realizing early on that you have to offer something different every year. I mean, you can still bring your old favorites because if you have made, one year I made five sailboats and none of them sold. And I thought, what is wrong with these people? And I brought them back the next year and they all sold. So there's nothing wrong with that. But like with the Christmas ornaments, I try and give them something different every year. With Even with the fused glasses I've started doing, I try and make, some kind of different big piece every year because it's it's disheartening to come to Chimneyville and look in the booth and go, yep, I saw that last year. You know, we want something different that excites people. And and you see it when you, when we walk around during our little breaks and see other people's work and like, oh, that's wonderful. How did you do that? That's new. And I think that's important for craftsmen to look at especially if they think they're having a little bit of a dull year to say, okay, what, how can I shake this up a little bit? And a lot of them do it, I know. Yeah, so do you have, you know, for, for those that are fairly new in the guild, understanding customer base, repeat customers, mm -hmm. do you have any stories in that regard? I, I, I think for myself, what I've always tried to do is make a big showpiece, one showpiece to where that brings people into the booth. For me, it was the guitar for many years. And then I did a full size banjo with lights in it and they would come in and it cost a lot of money. And they're like, OK, well, that costs a lot of money, but I sure like looking at it. Then I took the guitar and I made little ones to hang on your Christmas tree. I think it's really important to have that small item that people can take home with them. And it's really amazing to me how many people come back after that and they want the big item too. Uh, it, it, 
it's that one year I thought I'm just going to make little things because the big things won't sell. And we had a little bit of a slump. And, and amazingly, people will still come back and want the bigger one, the bigger item, something different. Uh, this past year, all the large items sold and the small ones didn't. And I thought, I guess that's because everybody was stuck at home during the pandemic and they had lots of money to spend. So they bought all my big things. And I thought, <laughs> what am I going to do with all the other stuff? But you just save it for next year. Talk to me about, you know, you working with glass. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be your assistant because I'd be so afraid I'd break something. But talk to me about preparing for a show and how do you transport glass? I, I am the queen of bubble wrap. As everybody at Chimneyville knows that if you need to borrow some bubble wrap, just come on over to me. I have all the bubble wrap you want. Um, for my things that are flat, I pack in cardboard and I take the cardboard with me. So when people buy them, I can pack it with bubble wrap and cardboard around it. Everything else goes in glass tubs. Occasionally I've had a really large showpiece that that's when you just hold your breath and, and uh, bring it in and hang it up and go, okay, don't touch it. You know, the fuse glass is not as fragile as stained glass is. I actually dropped, I had a lady drop an ornament on in the crate in the craft center last year at Chimneyville. And she was like, oh my gosh. And I'm like, no, I picked it back up. It was fine. It wasn't broken. So it's a little denser, but you know, like a lot of people's work, it is, it is fragile. And when people ask for a window out and they would say, I want to insert it in my house and have this glass. And I said, well, you know, you realize if you're mowing the lawn, you flip a rock up, you've just broken your $5,000 window. So I said, go, let's fit it in and put it behind your glass and let them break your glass outside. And this will be okay. And I've never had one in my windows break yet. What a great one. Great suggestion. Mm -hmm. are, are there any thoughts about the difference between indoor and outdoor shows? Yes, I've done a few outdoor shows and I was really lucky in all of them. The weather was nice. Uh, I did I did one in past Christian where the weather was starting to get bad and they told everybody just pack up. So I have my tents and I have my tables and glass is not the best thing to take to an outdoor show. Um, I really, I, I, I'm envious of the jewelers that can put everything in a box and go home or the guys that make the wooden bowls and like to have just throw it on the tub and leave. Mine's got to be carefully wrapped up, but I love outdoor shows and I love going to outdoor shows. And so, and participating is fun and people are usually so happy when they're outside. Uh, but I will say that this past Chimneyville at the craft center we had, I've never seen a happier crowd of people come in the doors, they were delighted with the whole thing. It was a lot of fun. So you've done shows and exhibitions. You've done a lot mm -hmm. of that? Yes, I started out um, doing a lot of demos with the stained glass because you can solder and people love to watch that solder go. And I've, I've demoed at shops where I, some of my things have sold, some little art galleries. I demoed at the art museum. Um, and it is fun because people come by and ask you questions. And so you can answer, but you can still work at the same time. And almost always they want to buy whatever it is you're making. They want that piece. So you're like, okay, I'll put your name on that. Cause they watched you make it. And that's, what's so exciting about it is them watching you make it. So then they want to have it. What's the most unusual piece that you've created that you could think of right now? I made a full sized sailfish all out of mirrors. I bought large mirrored sheets of glass and it, some of the mirrors were textured and had waves in them. Some of the mirrors were tinted blue for his fins and then his long uh, pointed beak, whatever they have. And, and it was full size. It was about four feet by four feet. I must've been out of my mind to take that on. And I actually took it down to Mexico beach and did an art show there with it and brought it back to Chimneyville and it sold out of Chimneyville the same, the same year, but it was, it was different. It was Laura. I don't know what possessed me to do that, but I used to go to Mexico beach and do their art and wine show every year. And I had a little following there before they got hit by the hurricane and sold a lot of stuff there. What would you say to a hobbyist or novice artist or craft person that was interested in becoming a member of the Craftsman's Guild? We, we love our, our new members. We love encouraging people to become members. The main thing I would say to them is don't be scared to try. 
I was scared to try for so many years. I thought, I'm not good enough. I don't do this part of it. I only do this kind. They're going to not like my work. And the thing is, I've been on standards committee for years. And when somebody brings work in, we don't ever say that's that's not good enough or nobody goes, oh, my God. It's always, OK, what, what do we like about this? What can they improve on? What can we do to help them? We offer them a mentor. We offer them explanations. If somebody's not quite up to par yet, we say, you know what? We've got another standards coming in four months. If you do this, this, and this, we'd like you to resubmit. Usually we do not charge them another fee to resubmit. We want to encourage people to go ahead and, and try and express themselves and learn that half the people are good enough to get in immediately, more than half. And the other ones are right, they're right there. So all they got to do is just this much more. And then we love, we love having new members. We love it. So you've been on the standards committee. That means you do part, of, you do the adjudication. You're one of the people mm -hmm. that do the adjudication. Uh, just talk briefly about the importance of an artist statement. An artist statement, I think it just gives us a little bit of insight into why they're doing what they're doing. And, you know, we just get the statement and the work and what's in the work. So that gives us a little insight into their brain. Like, now we see what we're looking at, but what do you want us to see what we're looking at? And, and so that's why it helps us understand their thought process. And a lot of times we're like, I, I get it now. I understand what you're saying. Now. So it is really important. And for me, I love being on standards because I didn't know anything about wood carving or knitting, fibers, quilting. And I love being around the expert quilters and expert woodworkers that say, now, now see this, this, this shows that they really know what they're doing. We're like, oh, okay. You know, and, and it, it's a very educational process for me just as a glass person. Excellent. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Well, I want to share that the Craftsman's Guild is going strong. We're still in our beautiful building and we'd love to have people come by and visit. Uh, I am the president this year. I've been president for two years and it looks like I'm going to be president for two more years. Um, we're encouraging our craftsmen to bring more and more work in. And since there have not been many shows, we have an abundance of beautiful work in the gallery for people to come see. And we have excellent help there that will help you choose whatever gift you'd like. And we're about to have a show. So come see us. It's just a lot of fun and it's outside and we follow all COVID-19 protocol. Yes, yes. And the guild is located or the center is located at 950 Rice Road in Ridgeland, Mississippi, on the, I guess that's the north side from the reservoir? Well, the other side is the reservoir, so if you see a big old gray building, that's us, and it's Bill Waller Craft Center, and just come on in. They're open from Monday through Saturday. No, we're open Tuesday through Saturday. We're closed on Sundays and Mondays, and it's 10 to 5, and our spring showcase show is coming up in April. Oh, that's exciting. And yes, mm -hmm. I remember going over there for the, um, it wasn't that long ago where, um, was it Chimneyville? I don't it remember. was Chimneyville, first weekend in December. We actually had it two weekends this year of and Chimneyville. So I remember and walking in and there was someone there, you know, to um, you're making sure you had your mask, hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. I think they were there taking temperatures. So they, yes. they are using all the protocols and booths were distant from one another. Mm -hmm. Not too many people at any one booth at any one time. You know, we've been we've been home for a long time and there's nothing wrong with getting out and going to the gallery and some of the work is at the Pearl Outlet Mall mm -hmm. as well. And then we have our store gallery as well as the George Berry Gallery, which this month for the month of, well, for the month of February, uh, there was an exhibit of African-American mm -hmm. guild members works. And there were a, a very diverse group of artists that uh, exhibited. So it's the place to be, it's the place to go. And it's wonderful mm -hmm. meeting artists like you, Debbie. How can the viewers get in touch with you if they wanted to know more if they, or if they wanted to purchase your work? Um, my work is sold through the gallery and uh, 
I don't have a website, but um, my email address is all small letters, D-H-O-G-A-N, the number five, at yahoo.com. And that's because I'm the fifth of the five Hogan daughters. So it's dhogan5 at yahoo.com. And I do have a few pieces of work here, but I always like try and keep things at the gallery to help the Craftsman's Guild out. That is wonderful. You can always find a gift over there or any time you're looking for something and people will ooh and ah and love every bit of it. Debbie, thank you so much for being on The Crafty View and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Diane. It's good to see y'all. Thank mm -hmm. you.